Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my lecture into, and I'm reaching the conclusion of my lecture into an introduction into methods of qualitative research. We are on section 2.1 of my lecture notes. This is still um, an attempt to analyze and assess Judith Butler's work and her discourse on, and her attempt to destabilize the foundations of structuralist account. We recognize that a lot of that attempted destabilization was itself rooted in Plato and Plato's Timaeus. In the next section, we'll talk specifically about that. What I want to do in this section is I want to go through and give you a number, a series of qualitative uh, examples in which you can take Butler's work and use it to make sense of your qualitative research studies. Um, tons and tons of application. So let's not waste any more time, and let's begin the series. So this introduction. And this is section 2.1. Okay, so um, power and its conferral of subjectivity. Okay, power and its ability to confer subjectivity. Number one, schema as form or shape. The schematization of heteronormativity constructs and, defi and defends a process of identification and exclusion. In terms of power, the structure of power, power is in place, as per Foucault as well, to confer identity. Right, power is in place to confer subjective identity. How is subjective identity conferred? Um, not explicitly. There are instances in which it is conferred explicitly, and I gave the example much, much earlier in the lecture series when I spoke about the ability to unite. So if insofar as you unite an individual, the individual, um, the identity of being knight is a direct conferral of power. It's very rare that that happens. So the conferral is indirect, and the process of conferral, <coughs> the process of conferral is a consequence of our norms. Right? The process of conferral is a consequence of our norms. Also our legal code to an extent, but more so our, our norms. In I'm going to go through this quick. There's no need to belabor the point. We've spent a tremendous amount of time on it al already. You can understand that if we're talking about heteronormativity as manifesting power, right? if we're talking about hetero heteronormativity as um, one aspect of the manifestation of hegemonic power, then subjective identity is conferred in one or two ways. You are either heterosexual or not. You are either heterosexual, which is the norm, and if you are identified as, and you identify as heterosexual, then your subjective identity is normal. If, and I mean, I mean, I mean to play on the sort of the, the way in which norms confer normality, right? That wasn't a slip, that wasn't Freudian, that's, I, I did that explicitly, right? What I want to emphasize here is the degree to which norms confer in the conferral of subjective identity, normality. You're normal. You're a normal person, right, because you're heterosexual. If you're not heterosexual, then you are abnormal. Um, and in terms of your abnormality, you can recognize immediately abnormality is the first step into um, pathologized identity, right? And I did this as well. So what's at stake here is the recognition that the constructs of power are so powerful that they can confer subjective identity, there is a way in which power indirectly can shape the subject. Subjects can become and have a sense of who they are in relationship to, unbeknownst to them, structures of power in, in place, exercising force, not in terms of pressure, but in terms of social norms, social relationships, social nexus, to confer the identity on the subject. And subjects will either conform or not. You can imagine that those who are identified as being abnormal, as I said much earlier, 
might seek to um, reacclimate, might seek to readapt, might seek to sort of free themselves of their abnormality, right? They might shun that aspect of their lives, but the truth of the matter is it's really what you're doing then is you're dejecting yourself. You're rejecting yourself, right? You're attempting to quote-unquote rehabilitate an aspect of yourself that is who you are. So you can imagine that there is a sense in which this, this schema could lead to a schism, and I don't necessarily mean schism in terms of the psychological sense of schism. I'm not trained to talk about that. But the individual insofar as I am not part of the normalized group, but I'm now, as a consequence of the conferral of subjective identity, identified as other, you can imagine that certain segments of that, this is a statistical fact, right? Certain segments, I don't know what the statistics would be, but absolutely it's the case that a portion of that segment will then seek to deject who it is that they actually are. Some people will embrace it and not and, and fight, sort of fight the power. No, I am me and I am good and I'm safe and I'm sane and blah, 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 and forget the establishment and da, da, da. And they wage the campaign for inclusion. Others won't make that move, right? Um, not necessarily many others. Uh, a significant portion of the community of others won't make that move, that fight for inclusion. And what they'll do is they'll retain that pathologized identity. They buy into their pathology. They buy into their sort of self-debasement, self-hatred, right? And this, these individuals become very toxic because these individuals, if we're talking about LGBTI community and such, these are the individuals that fight against LGBTI rights and are themselves homosexuals. That's just an example. There are any number of examples. There's no need for me to be vulgar and give concrete descriptions of this. But the idea is the the discontinuity in that segment of this marginalized community is very, very volatile. It's very, very dangerous. Why? Because they actively seek to undermine, not only themselves, they destroy their community. Right? They're, that self-loathing, that self-hatred um, becomes the vehicle with which they destroy their own community as a means of denying who they really are. Right? So I'm going to deny gay rights, I'm going to deny you know, as is just a sort of obvious example, I'm going to deny gay rights, I'm going to deny LGBTI recognition, and themselves are gay. These laws pass, these policies pass, people's rights are lost. And in a sense, it's a consequence of that self-loathing. Obviously, this is sort of superficial example. The point being, the more sort of ominous point being, that it is that self-hatred, that self-dejected -deject sentiment, this me sort of abasing my, my own nature, me not, not defending and fighting for myself, individuals who lose that, that fortitude, that willingness, they destroy their own community, that, oh, they, they destroy the community, right? They're, they're very, very toxic people. Um, in terms of qualitative application, what are the affects, the influences of systema um, systematic, what does that say? Of systematic under okay, sorry. What are the affects of systematic under-representation within political establishment for those who have marginalized identity. We can talk about that sort of generally. And you can imagine what that would be. Individuals are marginalized. Their marginalization is a consequence of some enforced uh, or recognized norm. As a condition of that marginalization, they either have no political representation or have very little menial political representation. And the way in which you bolster representation for your community is to transform your marginalization into the fold. But insofar as you do that, you reinforce the system that implemented the norm to begin with. Right? I'll let you process that for a bit. But it, there's a catch-22 to this, right? Insofar as you gain political representation, you do so um, at the expense, in many instances, not in all instances, but you do so, in many instances, at the expense of um, the preservation of that distinction. And what you end up doing is you just create or transform the nature of the norm. Now, it's normal to be identified as what was otherwise, in some foregone time, abnormal. The norm's still there. The norm's still functional. The only thing is, you're represented politically now. You're represented via power now. And as such you have expanded and augmented the norm.
there's still other individuals who aren't represented. The idea is it's only those members of the marginalized community that recognize the need for political affiliation that ever get anything done. Everybody else who sort of abstains, you're sort of, there's no will, there's no volition, then, you know, you just have to wait. And then those individuals who self-abase, those individuals who self-loathe, those individuals who are toxic and, and self, self-destroying will destroy also significant portions of that population by, by, by demonizing the very thing that they are, by hating the very thing that they are, by denying the very thing that they are. Which, which is, which is obviously not going to result in, which is obviously not going to result in benefits to that community. So, how might laws be used to reinforce a system of exclusion? That's sort of obvious. I'm not going to address that. What is the nature of social transformation in relation to the political establishment? I think also that too is obvious, right? The relationship between social transformation and political establishment is one of representation, right? You need to have. Not only your, it, you know, and I don't mean representation in this biological sense, right? Unfortunately, representation is now like, okay, ethnical representation or religious representation or sexuality representation. No, representation also ideological, right? Um, theoretical representation. Now, this is less important at the political level. I mean, it's absolutely important at the political level, but there really isn't an edifice with which that functions. In academia, different story, definitely. But the idea is... It's not just biological representation, right? That's not just what we're talking about. But the idea is, insofar as I'm in a position to make decisions on behalf of the greater populace, I take my subjective embodiment with me to the decision table. And it's through me and through my life experience and my relationship with friends and family and my mom, my dad, my brothers, my, you know, my wider community of friends and religious community that I make this decision. And if you and I lived in the same community, uh, had the same friends, had the same associations, da, 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 and you made it and I didn't, obviously that fact is going to at least inform how you make the decision, right, to some extent. Okay, so number two, um, the operations of power confer being. The subjugation of individual to an always already existing nexus of power relations is one of the conditions of the individual's intelligibility. It's a mouthful, right? The individual to an always already, the subjugation of the individual to an always already existing nexus of power relations is one of the conditions of the individual's intelligibility. The individual, the individual, knowledge of self, this is self-knowledge, self-knowledge, and my knowledge of the individual It's actually socio-political, so I'll just write that, socio-knowledge uh, of self, K-N-O-W-L-E. So my self-knowledge and the knowledge that others have of me is itself always already, this is always already situated, and this is what it's saying, right? My knowledge of self and others' knowledge of me is always already situated within a nexus of power relationships, right? Uh, this is obvious. You know me as Dr. Campbell, right? Others know me as other things, and others know me as other things. The idea is, in terms of my subjective identification with respect to our relationship, virtual as it is, obviously part of the nature of your recognition of me, your identification of me, is because of the power conferred to me in terms of my having completed the education, blah, 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 right? Part of the reason why you watch me is because of that conferral of power. This guy is qualified to talk about subject matters X, Y, Z. Don't listen to him when he starts talking about physics because he doesn't know crap about physics, which is precisely why I don't talk about that stuff. I let the scientists talk about that stuff. In terms of the social science stuff, I know it. So um, I'm in a position in order to express not just my knowledge, but express myself I situate myself within an already existing nexus, that nexus being virtual distance education. I put myself in that already existing nex nexus. So this cup, if you will, this sort of repository would be, in my example, virtual education. It existed before. I mean, it didn't theoretically exist before me, per se, because it's a new adaptation. But, you know, I didn't build it. You know, I didn't in develop or 
finance the technology, blah, blah, blah. But you get the idea. It was already there. There was a time at which uh, Khan is a perfect example. He was doing virtual education before I did it. So it existed before me. Well, I recognize that it exists. I jump into this existence. There's already a pre-established relationship. They're not pre-established participants. I don't know, this person's going to do this to this person, this person's going to teach this person that. But I recognize that this social relationship I've created, and think about this, right? I've created a repository prior to even knowing who the participants or who the individuals will be. I don't know who's going to play this role. I don't know who's going to play the role of the professor. I don't know who are going to play the roles of the students. The technology affords me the role for the participant, the role for the educator, the role for the student, the role for the researcher. I have that there. I recognize it. It's all, that structure is already there. It's always already there. I jump in and I play my part. Insofar as I play my part, I'm playing my part and it's reaffirming my subjective identity. It's because I'm playing my part that I affirm my identity. If I were to come in this role and I, you know, and this is my pet peeve, right? If I were to come in this role and I was to sit back and lounge all day and I didn't really do much, I got the cushion job, you know, I'm a big professor now, I don't have to do nothing, I just teach my little classes, or throw up some PowerPoints and just, you know, wrote sort of brute sort of, you know, information regurgitation semester after semester after semester. Well, yeah, then I can do a whole bunch of side stuff and do all types of other crap because, you know, this is not, there's nothing really here. It's just, this is a way to generate money. A meager money at that. And if you're in this for the money, you really chose the wrong career. I mean, there's, you could, you could do well, but there's so many other things you can do to make more money. No, the whole point of this is to recognize that my subjective identity that I gain from playing this role, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, I have the qualifications, but playing this part in this social relationship, one, this social relationship is already, is always already pre-constructed. This social relationship, to reduce it to its base, you know, teacher-student, I mean, this goes back to antiquity. So I jump in to play the part of the role, and so far as I jump in to play the part of the role, I fill that social gap, and so far as I fill that social gap, it requires an audience. I would stop doing this were there not to be an audience. Well, you never know with me. I, no, I really would stop. I wouldn't be doing it. Obviously, it would be ridiculous to do lecture series that nobody else is ever going to watch. The whole point of creating a lecture series is to inform others, right? So that the idea is, the idea is, in terms of this relationship, it's the way in which, and this is the beautiful part of it, right? Um, and you'll see how this, uh, this applies to gender identity and such in a bit. It's the way in which this always already existing social nexus confers sort of pre-established subjective identity. To be technical, it's very dense, but you know, you're going to be born into a world where everybody has to play their parts and you're going to find the part that you need to play. Um, and, and you're going to find the part that you need to play. Right? If you don't like your role, you can work hard to change your roles, but other than that, you're going to play your part. That's kind of the ghetto vibe now that I want you to feel. I'll complicate that much later. What's important to understand is the relationship between the social nexus and its ability to confer subjective identity, and that the conferral of subjective identity isn't about the individual specific subject as it is any random subject X. Right? So it's always already waiting for the new person to fill that void. All right, next application. Relations of dominance, right? Middle of page 28, section 2.1. Relations of dominance and subordination are facts of marginalized identities. How might these relations change for the worse, for the better? How might the relations of marginalization and dominance change for the worse, for the better? I'm not going to go into this now. You can look at any number of liberation theories, you can look at Ferrari, you can look at um, Galton, you can look at any number of, you can look at Chomsky, you can look at any number of theorists to find out any number of theoretical discourses that will talk about sort of the inversion of the usurpation of structures of power. So if you're intellectually predisposed to believe that there will be a final act of liberation, well that's good. We need people who believe that. It's your responsibility, however, if that is your belief, and a lot of liberal academics have this belief, but it's important to recognize that it's not just the mere sort of recitation of the belief that's of any significance. How would we arrive at a state in which liberation would finally be achieved? 
who are we fighting, right? To whom will the spoils go? Are there even going to be spoils? Is there any loot to be had? What are we fighting against? What are we fighting for? Do we expect retaliation, yes or no? And on and on and on. So it's easy to talk about it theoretically, and it's never to dissuade students, right? If, you, if you're intellectually inclined to think that there is an external oppressor and that that external oppressor needs to be, um, uh, needs to have its power overthrown, then, you know, discuss the conditions in which that might unfold. If you believe that there's an external oppressor and there needs to be um, sort of negotiations politically, international mobilization against such, let's talk about it. NGO affiliations, sure, let's talk about it. There's room for discussion. There's room for discussion, but what's important here is a recognition of um, the parties to the conflict, obviously, the social nexus that validates and legitimizes and invariably confers social identity, and a recognition that the control of social identity is itself a manifestation of power. Right? So that even if you were to talk about sort of liberation as such, in terms of in terms of liberation as such, there would still be traces, even if you were to grant the most charitable interpretation of sort of an egalitarian world of view, there would still be the need for social identification based on social functionality. We need people to play roles in society, not just be a doctor or a lawyer, but to facilitate certain social needs. And individuals who facilitate those needs are facilitating those needs on behalf of the systems of power that put those needs into practice. Thus, even if, theoretically, you had sort of an egalitarian state um, in its most abstracted sense, if the systems of power needed some social functionality, it needed a social functionality. Somebody got to fill that job. Somebody got to do that job. Somebody's got to do this role. And what would, I mean, the idea is, if someone says no, then what? If everybody says no, then what? If, if someone joins in and the acts that manifest as a consequence of that social functionality don't benefit everybody, then what? Right? It's, it's, it's easy to talk about liberation and abstraction. I think what's really important, and again, this is not to discourage. This is not to discourage. But I want to hear a more robust from graduate students, right, and the next generation of scholars. I want to hear a more, a, a more robust articulation of institutions of oppression and domination, specifically, not abstractly, right? This specific institution of um, um, racial apartheid in South Africa under this, these leaders with respect to the marginalization of this community was wrong, and here is how it was overthrown or should be overthrown. Fine, let's talk about that. Oppression generally, you know, um, you know, marginalization generally, it can be done. It can be done theoretically, but uh, it's a much more difficult sales pitch. Um, is true metaphysical, this is what I'm talking about right now, right? Is true metaphysical liberation even possible? Is it meaningful to conceptualize power relations devoid of dominance? Yes, no. I'm just positing stuff. You answer it as you see fit. So here's a direct quote from Butler. Quote, power operates in the constitution of the very materiality of the subject and the principle which simultaneously forms and regulates the subject of subjectivization. What in the world does that mean? Power informs the body. I'm not really going to take it to its most deep point. Butler, shout out to her, I'm sure she's a very, I mean, she's obviously she's a, she's a genius scholar. Um, there are implications of this that's far deeper than just sort of heterosexual normativity and gender identity and gender politics. No, but the idea is that power does inform our subjective identity. Power does transform our body, right? It not only transforms our body, it, it creates the very constitution with which I'm identified. What does that mean? Part of my identification as a human being in day-to-day -day terms, John Doe on the street, is that I'm a black guy. I'm a black guy with tats. That means something. Why does it mean something? It means something because there was a system in place that was intentfully designed to attribute meaning to my blackness. It changes over time, and I have seen amazing things happen, you know, in the last year, in the last few months, where the world is definitely more inclusive. I'm, I'm so freaking, I don't know, I, you know, I might... I might be rekindling the idealism of my youth. 
<laughs> but, you know, no, it's not just being a black guy, white guys, Chinese guys, Spanish guys, whoever, right? The, the, the idea is you see me as a black guy and you think, oh, no, that's just a biological fact. Like, my eyeballs are seeing the blackness come off you. But you clearly, I'm not black. I'm brown. And it would be a particular hue of brown. And this is who I am as a person. Blah, blah, blah. But the idea is, no, you, when you see me, you're, not, you're seeing my biology, yes, you're seeing some factual facticity of sort of my embodiment, but what you're really seeing is your vision, if you will, is filtered through the social construction of my blackness. Like, you see my blackness, right? You see me being tatted. And if I'm in a beater and I got, and I got you know, the tats out, and I have my headphones on and it's blasting, then you're like, wow, I see a potential threat. Let me walk on the other side. Which you shouldn't, because I'm not a threat. But you get the idea, right? The, the idea is that power, power is powerful enough to control the way in which you see others and others constitute themselves. So some people flee from their homosexuality. Some people flee from their blackness. Some people embrace their homosexuality. Some people embrace the dark side. Um, and on and on and on. So, next bit. Uh, none, of, none of this is sort of mind-shattering information. It's just sort of immediate, quick application of some of the concepts. Next is, how bodies? How are bodies regulated? Is your body regulated? That's a great question. D don't just read it through that quickly. Is your body regulated? So how are bodies regulated? Think about that. Is your body regulated? Yes or no? If yes, how? If no, why? I'm not going to even address any of these. I just want to put this out there for you to think about. Graduate students need to get in the process of thinking about questions and then trying to seek answers, uh, you know, logical answers, to facilitate an answer to the question that they pose to themselves. So, do you agree with how it is regulated, assuming that you do believe that it's regulated? Are you aware of its regulation? How might regulation be imposed? How might regulation be willingly sought? I think that last bit is hard, right? How is, if you do believe that bodies are regulated, how might regulation be sought? I think academia is a great institution for those who seek, um, the military is a great institution for those who seek that regulation because it's very hierarchical. Academia has a very, very explicit hierarchical structure. Right? You go from being an adjunct to being um, maybe a visiting, to being an assistant, to being an associate, to being a professor, to being distinguished. Right? And there's no skipping any of those wrongs. You got you to gotta work to get the title. Um, and in terms of graduate students, you don't get the, PA, the PhD without the master's. You don't get the master's without the bachelor's. You don't get the bachelor's without the associates. So that in order to attain this, it's a representation that you've done all of that. And you can see how individuals might seek that regulation. I want an external force to impose rules and stricture upon me because either I don't have the self-discipline to do it myself and I need some discipline, so go to Uncle Sam and join the military. He'll teach you how to be disciplined. He'll teach you how to, and it'll work. You'll, you'll have these tools for the rest of your life. You'll get up, you'll be fit, you'll understand what it is to do without for a while, you'll understand sacrifice for the greater good, you'll make meaningful contributions to your society and to the world. If you want to come to academia, yeah, you can become a professor. You can go off to teach anywhere to do anything, to usurp the prestige and the power of your own instructors and be better and smarter than the people who taught you. But you're not going to do it if you're not willing to seek external regulation of your life. Like if you're so like, oh, it's me and how dare anybody tell me how I ought to live my life. I chart my own path. That's all well and good for any number of things in the world. But for, for, for those who are so inclined, uh, it takes a very um, fortuitous personality type to be able to subjugate him or herself, him or herself to very stringent external regulation. Um, and you know, the payoff, if you can, if you can adapt and if you can make it to the, to the upper echelon, is, it, it, it could be potentially huge. What does that mean? What does that mean? How, how are we going to conceptualize uh, that ability in terms of that, that is that ability and that willingness to be regulated, assuming that people are regulated in any number of degrees, how are we going to um, make sense of that with respect to a feminist discourse, with respect to a contemporary 21st century 
sort of social media immersion discourse with respect to progressions in education and educational movements, and progression in political and political movements. Any number of things. How? You tell me. I don't know. Number four, Foucault's um, History of Sexuality. Here's a direct quote. Uh, and I think this is, I think this is, um, I think this is interesting, right? Renounce yourself or suffer the penalty of being suppressed. Do not appear if you do not want to disappear. Your existence will be maintained only at the cost of your nullification. It's pretty ominous, right? Subjective identity is so powerful that the institution of power, you don't have to think about Uncle Sam here. You don't have to think about, you know, your particular, you know, your nation's hierarchy, your nation's sort of the, the, the um, ultimate manifestation of political power, whatever entity that might be for whatever nation you live in. Think about mom and dad. Think about the power that mom and dad have. Now, let's think, you know, 1960, 1950. Mom and dad ascribe to heteronormativity. And here is Dan and Mary. And Dan's going to come out the closet. And Mary's straight. Do you think for a second that mom and dad cannot nullify his existence, his identity? as both son and brother because of their ability to shame and to marginalize their own son. You know how many people have this life experience, who have this life story? Let's, let's look back and read this, right? Renounce yourself. You can imagine at the dinner table, mom and dad having this conversation with this young kid. Dude, renounce your practices. I don't want to say repent because that sounds way too religious and I don't want to piss people off. That's not my intent. So not repent, but you get the vibe, right? Like, um, like uh, rehabilitate yourself, right? Renounce yourself. You're, you're gay. Or suffer the penalty of being suppressed. That the parent wouldn't say that. That's a bit too stringent, too formulaic. Renounce yourself. Deny this gay stuff. Don't tell me about that gay stuff. Why? Because if you tell me about that stuff, you know, it's not right. It's not moral. It's not right. Renounce that. Just, just be the good old you. Be the you that I know that you really are. Don't be that you. That, that's not the real you. Right? So renounce yourself or suffer the penalty of being suppressed. Do not appear if you do not want to disappear. Now, the implication of this doesn't have to be lethal, but the idea is, I'm letting you know now. You can imagine that, you, you know, there's a, you can tell there's an escalation in the tone in this citation. It's an escalation. So there's an opportunity to renounce yourself, right? And if that opportunity to renounce yourself occurs, then you have really debased yourself because you're denying the very thing that you are. So, renounce yourself. I just can't, you know, this is who I am. Da -da -da. Renounce yourself. I just can't. You can imagine four or five dinners later. Listen, if you don't renounce yourself, now in escalation, what happens? Um, don't appear. You're no longer welcomed in our home. Don't come back home. Right? We don't want you. I, I can't imagine. And I know there are people who experience this, right? I know that there are people. There's probably thousands and tens of thousands of people. And I can't imagine the pain. I really cannot imagine the pain of having your loved ones tell you, like, don't come home for Thanksgiving because you're gay. Right? It's probably less likely now because we're so inclusive. But you better believe 50s, 60s, 70s, that was heavy. A lot of people probably lost their identity as son, as daughter, as uncle or aunt, as nephew, as, as any number of familial identities because they were gay. So don't think that this can't happen. If this happens at a local, uh, uh, not a local, if this happens at a familial level, you better know that this happens at a much more macro level and think about the implications for marginalization, right? So that we need to understand in terms of subjective identification, it is absolutely a consequence of this social nexus. Uh, uh, it is a consequence of those who we love, those who we seek to, to attain identification from, the social functions that we do, the jobs that we do, all of this facilitates in conferring meaning to who you are, to who I am. And the idea is, it's really, 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 really painful to have that rejection, right? To have that wholesale, no, you're not one of us. You're not like me. And I don't want you here unless you're just like me. You gotta act a certain way in order Right, that, 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 that's, that's tough for people. But that happens all the time. So the idea is, in terms of qualitative application, 
Um, and I think a lot needs to be done with this one intersectionality of identity. I'm not going to talk about that, but you should look that up and incorporate more. You can, I don't believe enough is done in intersectionality of identity. Um, two, outside of just LGBTI stuff, uh, another way in which this unfolds, unfortunately, especially in an impoverished economic environment, I won't say a recession because technically we're out, but an impoverished economic environment is, um, I would imagine, there has to be, uh, maybe not, I don't know the facts, but I would imagine EEOC is probably inundated with, 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 with you know, worker violations, right? Why? Well, the, the labor market is huge. I got infinite sources of people who want a job. I work at Big Corporation X. There's a billion people who can replace you, right? So you can imagine if you're working for me, then you got to do work the way I want work done. And if you don't like it, haul ass. Somebody else can get your job. The idea is, of course, we recognize that there are there is this possibility, but that identification that one is that one has with work will allow an individual likely to stay at work and suffer the consequences of uh, a toxic work environment and and the psychological stressors of and the frantic nature of a psychologically taxing stressing work environment because without it there's nothing else does that then legitimize the creation of psychologically stressing Working environments? No, we need to make sure that work environments are just like they've always been. And the whole point of a good working environment is to increase productivity, right? Assuming, I mean, most working environments are about productivity. So the idea is, no, there shouldn't be stressors, right? It should be about, um, it should be about increasing productivity. And those, who, those employers who recognize that because of the depressed uh, economic climate, don't think that that depressed economic climate gives you the green light to then exploit your laborers. Why? Because you better believe somebody's watching. Right? You better believe that, you know, the power that you think you have is always going to be usurped by somebody who's got substantially more power than you have. So you got to be able, you, you have to recognize, right? You have to recognize as a graduate student, you have to be able to identify the ways in which subjective identity is conferred socially, and there are any number of ways that is conferred socially, and those aspects of the conferral of subjective identity that lead to marginalization, that lead to being labeled abnormal, well, we need to talk about that because the identity was conferred. So in a sense, you've bequeathed me a headache. You've bequeathed me drama. You've bequeathed me, you've sort of socially constructed me um, a role that results in me being marginalized. And the question is, what is that? What might that look like? How might we articulate that? How might we change that? How might we transform that? How do we make sense of that? That's your job, not mine. Bottom of page 28. Is the continuity of subjective collective identification itself contingent on political power recognition? If so, how? Does political recognition um, or lack thereof influence sociocultural empathy? Is there a connection to empathy? If so, what is it? Obviously, in terms of empathy, um, we have an ability to empathize with others insofar as we have an understanding of their lived experience. I've been where you've been. I felt what you felt. So don't feel too bad because I felt that thing one time before and it worked out well for me. And I don't mean this metaphorically, like I went through what you went through and I turned out well, so don't stress. Okay, well, no, that's great empathy, right? Empathy can be a huge sort of sigh of relief because the individual is telling you, I've done what you've done. Right? I've, I've already completed a process, I've already felt the things that you felt, and I know it might seem taxing at this moment, but dot 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 dot. Empathy is very powerful, right? Why? Because for the person who is looking for empathy, seeking it, especially socially, if we're seeking empathy socially, it's, it's a great way, it's a perfect vehicle for sort of social transformation. Right, so if you're a young activist and you know, and you have a head full of ideals and you want to change the world, go out and do it. It's going to be hard. You're going to have people who are going to try and stop you. There's going to be a lot of stress involved. Don't think that it's going to be a cakewalk. But when you get upset, look at I'm okay. Look at Mahatma Gandhi. Look at the your sort of forefathers and foremothers in the fight. Look at you know Mother Teresa and others, um, and the efforts and the sacrifices that they had and they had to go through in order to get the change. But look at the payoff that they got. They changed the freaking world. They changed the world. You're not going to change the world without shedding a little bit of blood. 
Blood, sweat, and tears. You want to change the world? <laughs> That's what you're going to have to make a contribution of. Um, and I mean that, in a, in a, unless you want to be an armchair sort of activist, which is, which is fine. In terms of academia, the, the stress isn't going to be sort of, you know, in the streets fighting the authority and marching and such. But you can definitely construct and design the theoretical paradigms that will organize people's bodies, right? There's a need for that. And, of course, people will be orchestrating and organizing antithetical movements and antithetical ideological and theoretical, and that's part of the process as well. All of that is good. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of, the, in terms of empathy. Um, the conferral of social... Um, the, the conferral... Well, I mean, even take it a step deeper. If it's the case, and I, uh, I'll, I know it's the case, but I'll say if, just to really secure the position. If it's the case that subjective identity can be conferred by established power relations of any kind, and it's the case that that identity, that conferred identity, can be marginalized, then it has to be understood that you could conflate the two, not conflate, but sort of consolidate and uh, conjoin the two, and you can construct, and you can confer marginalized identification. It has to be the case, right? How is that done? As Foucault says, via pathologi pathologization is just one example. There's any number of ways of which you'll have to dig through the, the, vat, of, <laughs> the vat of abyss black to figure out any number of ways in which this might happen. But Foucault, I mean, Foucault talked about this perfectly. Foucault does not believe that homosexual identity is a truly pathologized identity, right? He would be self-loathing if he did, and he's, he wasn't. Foucault does not believe that the identity of homosexuality is in and of itself something other than a consequence of social construction. It's pure social construction. Thus, he recognizes that his identity was socially constructed to be marginalized, right? In terms of Butler, what we'll see as we progress, and I don't want to give this away just yet because I'm about to talk, to talk about it in a little bit, what we'll see is precisely the same structure. So Butler and Foucault, perfect sort of intellectual um, uh, accomplices. You can use Butler and Foucault to make real good sense of the conferral of a marginalized subjective identity, that's me, right? That doesn't come in either Butler or Foucault. That's me, but that's me giving voice to what I see as um, similarities, huge similarities in their intellectual um, paradigms, right? So that the idea is not just the conferral of subjective identity, but the conferral of a marginalized subjective identity is something that I think, something that I know we need to do more qualitative analysis on. So, um, in terms of number five, materiality designates a certain effect of power, right? That, that's sort of obvious. I, I sort of just explained that. Qualitative application. What is the effect or effects referenced in this citation? Right? And this is, this is important. I'll, I'll talk about some of the possibilities. How is power used to affect stuff? For example, objective reality. That's too obvious. I won't even talk about that. How might the post-structuralist account undermine the importance of materiality, does it undermine the importance of materiality? Okay, so basically what I'm saying here, and then I'll pause, um, check the video and everything, and then continue with, yeah, continue with this next part in terms of the application of Butler. The idea is, in terms of the quote, materiality designates a certain effect of power, you can imagine, in terms of objective reality, we look at the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers was, were, a physical representation, an infrastructural representation of American, primarily American, if not exclusively American, but generally speaking, just economic might, like the power of capital. So that's the, that's the visual representation of, I mean, that's what it is. It's, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's, there's no, that's, there's no depth to that. That's sort of obvious, right? So it is the physical representation the material representation of economic prowess, economic might. Okay, so that collapses, right? World Trade Center attacks happen, towers fall. 
And the idea is, it is a destruction of that economic might. Why? Because, I mean, now we are in a sense, we are in a sense in a depressed, recessed, recessed environment, right? economically speaking. Power is such that power can confer itself, it can manifest itself, materialize itself in absolutely anything. So the idea that the economic prowess and the economic might for which the Twin Towers were a representation, obviously I recognize it was a business building, they leased out offices, it generated revenue, it was a great tourist destination, blah, 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 the obvious stuff. I know that. Duh. We're talking about the symbolic representation of the towers. Does the destruction of the towers undermine in any sense, because the symbol was altered or destroyed, does that undermine the ability for power and the embodiment in terms of capital, for this example, to re-manifest itself in some other thing? Does that undermine that ability? Of course not. Oh, well, not oh well, I can't say it like that. It's not like oh well, the towers are done. Um, it was tragic, but in terms of the symbology of it all, the symbolic representation of that can be transposed to something else simply transposed to something else. So power manifests itself. Part of my lecture, part of my power, is my ability to do this and give to you as much as I can possibly give to you. Why? Because I know that you are going to create sort of uh, an, um, an, uh, an amalgamation of your ideas with the theorist ideas and my ideas and that I'm going to be sort of folded into your own self-education. It won't obviously be all me, because it's you and the theorist. But it's like three of us playing this game. It's me, you, and the theorist that we're talking about. And it's a combination of those three, so that when you talk about the theories, I'm, I'm informing, in some sense, right, my, the power of my ability to just persist in, you know, hour after hour of disseminating this lecture and to persist in reading and compiling the notes for this lecture pays off despite the fact that I'll never see this, in the fact that you evoke that effort on my, ha on my behalf when you talk to a person about the stuff that, that you're learning. Oh, well, you know, with Butler, you could do this. With Derrida, I learned that. Da, da, da. You can apply it to that. I think I'm going to write a paper. I heard what he said. I'm going to write a paper about this. I might publish a book next year about this. Da, da, da. Sort of borrow that idea. You know, he said you just wanted a shout out. Maybe I'll give him a shout out. Maybe I won't. It doesn't really matter. The idea is I've manifested myself. I've manifested my educational power um, in giving you the ability to do exactly what I'm doing, manifest your own power. So in terms of, in terms of um, materiality, it really is embodied. It's embodied in people and the exchange of information, and it's embodied in institutions and infrastructure in either the collapse or the rebuilding or rebranding of any number of things, right? So um, with that, I just want to pause here. I'm going to come back and pick up with understanding um, Butler and sort of this debate that's going to emerge. I had to do all of this sort of um, background work in order to make sense of what's happening because it's, a, it's like going to get pretty deep in a bit. But you wouldn't be able to understand the uh, theoretical sort of sparring between Ergure and Butler without an understanding of the ability to confer um, subjective identity. So I had to sort of do that bit. So I'm going to pause and then come back and continue. So, understanding Butler versus um, Erigore on the challenge of heteronormativity. So, the idea is to try and make sense of this understanding. This, what will be conflict between two feminists. One feminist um, representing, I wouldn't really say the old paradigm, the, the structuralist paradigm, but one feminist, Erigore, representing sort of that formulaic old structure. Um, and that's a bit of a generalization, to be sure. Butler representing the critique of that structure, right? Butler representing a, a more post-structuralist um, embodiment. And the question is, how do we make sense of this debate between feminists? Because the truth of the matter is that feminism, the first thing that you need to recognize is that feminism isn't just about women arguing um, against the same thing assuming the same positions. I mean, it's tragic that I even have to say that, but it isn't about that in any sense. 
there are feminists that don't agree with other feminists, and just like there are psychologists who don't agree with psychologists or philosophers who don't agree with philosophers, the idea is, no, not all feminists agree. Uh, again, it's, it, it's pejorative. It's really, I, I mean this, it's sort of, uh, let me start my time. It's, it shouldn't be the case that I even have to qualify that. But the truth of the matter is, yes, not all feminists agree, and this is an instance of a disagreement between feminists. Okay. Brief introduction to the cosmo uh, cosmogonical versus cosmological distinction and the importance of this basic understanding. So, um, I don't want to spend too much time in this. The dis difference between a cosmogony and a cosmology is simply a cosmogony is the origin of things. A cosmology is the nature of things, how things are, how things exist. The cosmogony is itself always already um, described in terms of the origin of things is always already described in terms of some seminal source. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you can imagine if I'm talking about the origins of things, I have to have a beginning. If I don't have a beginning, then I have to ask about what came first, right? What came before that? Well, if that's the origin, what came before that? And if you keep doing that, you fall into what's known as an infinite regress, and thus your cosmogony collapses into infinite, and it becomes ridiculous. So what you need to have is the origin. The, the one thing in which I can identify this as what Aristotle would call the uncaused cause. is It is itself not caused, and it is itself the cause of all other things. Now, in terms of traditional structuralist feminist theoretical underpinning, I can't even believe I'm being able to articulate this, uh, Butler is, and I'm sort of generalizing the whole thing so that you can understand the general structure, Butler is arguing that Aragore is making the fundamental appeal which is rooted in Plato. So, the origin is in Plato, Plato and his influence in the text, the Timaeus, he writes in such a way that the essentialist underpinnings inform all of the, well, most of the history and the origin of feminist theory. It's sort of, it's wedded to that cosmogony. Butler is interested more in identifying the cosmogonical origin, which is Plato in the Timaeus, destabilizing that, and then talking about the nature of things. In terms of the nature of things, the cosmology, Butler is arguing for um, a less materialistic, a less structuralist understanding of feminism. That's the best way that I can explain it. Profoundly dense. You have to forgive me if it was too dense, but that's, that's the nature of what's happening here. I, 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 there's really no other way for me to say it. All right, so number two. General understanding of form, matter, distinction, and its importance, which you can watch here. You can watch the distinction on it. I think that's, um, I don't know, it's either Plato or Aristotle, I forget. I think it's probably my Aristotle video. So in terms of 2A, in terms of Platonic, transcendental form and Aristotle's shared commonality in linguistic identification form, I need to explain the difference. Plato's form is a transcendental form. Plato believes that there is um, an ontic, ex existential perfection. At least he posited it. Whether he believed it or not isn't really relevant, but he posits this. So that when we talk about the form of goodness, the form of goodness actually exists, and everything else is um, an, a meager uh, or, you know, varying degrees of instantiation of this form. Aristotle does a different thing, and he doesn't posit a form in terms of goodness, justice, and such as an existential, ontological existence. He doesn't posit it as something in the world. What he recognizes is that form is conferred as a consequence of language. It's through our language that we are able, and obviously Aristotle is the father of taxonomy, so Aristotle recognizes the taxonomic ability to group and categorize and identify similarities in comparison and contrast. And insofar as he's able to make these taxonomic demarcations, Aristotle is capable and able to recognize form as language. 
right? It's in our language. It's that that we can talk about trees in general and not a specific tree. It's the fact that we can use a symbol of a tree to represent any number of things, including a tree, that, that our language is the source for the ultimate conferral of form. Okay? Again, deep as well, but there's no other way to say it. So, a quick aside, Judith Butler and Eric Gray presuppose or buy into the belief that Plato had a theory of forms. Not all philosophers subscribe to this interpretation belief, thus there's a potential weakness in both their arguments. This is just an aside. It's, it's false, fallacious, to assume that all philosophers believe that Plato had a theory of forms proper. Um, I recognize an alternative explanation of Plato's purpose and function in the dialogues, and I've, I was, you know, I, I studied under an instructor who sort of convinced me, in a sense, that much of what Plato was doing was developing pre-logical devices for education. It was pedagogical, right? So that before we had a recognition of um, universal generalizations and existential instantiations, before we made these logical, uh, via, via Aristotle, logical uh, insights into the laws of non-contradiction and such, um, this was an attempt via dialogue and the creation of interlocutors and such to teach students about rather complex stuff. Okay, so form distinction, so it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that Plato actually had a theory of forms. You don't have to ascribe to that belief. The idea is, irrespective of whether Plato had that belief or not, if, and this is an if, if Aragore and Butler make that assumption, then their, their argument is a little bit vulnerable to that assumption. It's not a jab, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just an assertion. Number three. So form matter distinction then becomes the condition for the possibility of understanding the fellow, phylogocentric economy. Right? This form matter distinction, I'll explain what this means, becomes a condition for possibly understanding the phylogocentric economy as regulatory, which excludes the feminine from either form or matter, despite and in recognition of the sexed female body. What does that mean in the world? What in the world does that mean? The idea is the distinction between form and matter is an important distinction. Why is this form matter distinction important? Well, you can imagine that if all I'm looking at with respect to human beings, now not, this is not hard science, and hard science is a different story, but with respect to persons, if all I'm looking at is the matter, the stuff of the person, what's readily observable, the individual person's body, maybe his or her own body gestures, the way in which he or she looks and such, if all I'm looking at of the individual is the individual's matter, I can't come to understand, right? I can't come to appreciate the whole structure. Right? If I'm looking at matter, I'm looking at something specific. Right? I'm going to look at, you can imagine, right? You, this would be good for like um, aesthetic, aesthetical theory. Right? If you're obsessing about the color, and you're obsessing about the placement of the color and the depth and the, the saturation of pigmentation and variations in, 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 in shading, you're not really appreciating the form. You're not appreciating the, the entirety of this thing. If an individual is obsessing about the individual, if one individual is, is obsessing about sort of the objectification of the person, the vulgarity of the person, the, the obviousness, sort of the low context aspect of a person, if it's debased to that point, then everything is lost because the beauty of the form is lost and the form is more complex, always more complex, more rich, more meaningful, more really authentic than just the vulgarity of the matter itself. The matter is what the matter is, but the truth of the matter is our form, right? And I mean this linguistically defined now, and I'll explain this in a second. Our form informs our matter. And this is where Butler's going. She wants to be able to identify the relationship she might not say this explicitly, but this is what she's doing, because she's making an appeal to Plato. She wants to be able to identify 
the way in which language informs the material world. The way in which the material world is already imbued with, filled with signification. That signification is itself linguistic. So the, the idea is one of the problems with feminism is from an essentialist point, and we'll see this in Plato, and this is the initial critique against Aragore, one of the initial problems is the, is the, the emphasis feminists place on the vulgarity of the body. If it's the case that I have to strip and show myself bare, if it's the case I have to strip and show myself bare and say, I do this, I do this, I am this, I say this, I say this, how debased have you become? There is no more debased that you can be. You've completely debased yourself, right? It is, it is the ultimate act of debasement to have to, and I mean this physically, literally, literally strip and then argue for a position. Right? There is, there is no lower that a person can go in explaining and demonstrating, and this is an example, and I'll tie this into sort of theory in a bit, and demonstrating that we, if we're going to obsess about the materiality of stuff, if we're going to obsess about, in terms of feminist theory, then I got, and you're going to have to forgive me, but this is the context, since you, you can imagine, this would be perfect, I'm going to role play for a second. Beautiful, hot, sexy girl, I'm going to play the role of the beautiful, hot, sexy girl. You're going to be the chauvinist pig. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying. So the chauvinist pig has the hot, sexy girl as a secretary, and I can't, help, oh, the, the dentist who fired the, the lady for being too hot. Let's play that role. So I come to work and I look good. And I look beautiful and sexy, but I'm not trying to be beautiful and sexy. I just look the way that I look. And you get all, you get the gaze of the, the boss. And the boss comes in and he's looking. And you know he's looking at the boobs. And you know he's looking at the ass. I'm being vulgar for a reason. He's looking at the boobs. He's looking at the ass. He's looking at the boobs. He's looking at the ass. He's looking at the boobs. And then there's a point at which you can imagine this would be the degradation, the degradation of matter. Would be, do you want to look at my boobs is it my boobs that you're interested in? Because if that's what you're interested in, I can show you my boobs. And she pulls off, opens her shirt, she exposes her bare breasts. Do you think that that act of making explicit, making vulgar, the materiality, does anything that could potentially contribute to her own identification? No. What she's done then is she's made that form the seductive element that he was really after, um, the, the, maybe the, the power element that, that was enticing and appealing, she made it explicit. Let's not play that game, let's play this game, and what would he do? He would say, oh, holy, well, I don't, I'm a little, I don't know what he would do. I don't know what he would do. He, would, he might either say, um, yeah, object, look, I get to see now. And some sort of freakish perversion and yeah, I get to see. Um, he might be regretful that it manifested in that way. He might not be, he might be indifferent. He might, who knows? But the idea is when we're talking about people and when we're talking about women as people and when we're talking about women as people within the context of feminism, we need to recognize that the real essence of the conflict between Aragore and Butler is Butler's more intellectually astute argument that you're missing the form, Aragore, traditional feminist, you're missing the real beauty, the real high context, super duper intelligent stuff. We're debasing ourselves if we're always referring back to the materiality. We can do the materiality. But when we do the materiality, it's tits and ass, it's tits and ass, it's tits and ass, and that gets old. Rather than recognizing that tits and ass became tits and ass as a consequence of, here's the narrative, informing how this came into play. Here's a narrative, informing how these structures of power imbued meaning in the materiality. It's because of these external, socially constructed, linguistic relationships, that you see this relationship, that you see this person, that you see these people or women or what have you in the way you see them. So that the idea is at its most abstracted sense, and this is way out there, 
in a combination and in concert with things that I've said earlier throughout, the individual, you can imagine the dentist in that example of the dentist who fired his, his, his attractive you know, employee, it wasn't, he didn't see what was. Right? This is a, a famous line from Joan of Arc that I love, right? In many other movies, right? it, it, it reoccurs frequently. The dentist didn't see what was. He didn't see a form. He didn't appreciate the complexity and the beauty in it. What he saw was the materiality. What he saw was the vulgarity. And it's not to deny the, the, the matter, right? This is, what, and this is precisely what Butler says earlier. I forget the page where I have it. Butler said, I'm neither arguing for materiality or against materiality. It's true. Yes, of course there's some vulgarity there. Of course, yes, this is, we can be beasts. Of course we can be strong. Of course we can be violent. Of course we can be vitriolic. Of course we can be seduct seductress and sexy and hot and lustful. And of course we can do all of these things. Of course we can do that. But we can do so much more. We can do so much more. And the idea is what I, what I absolutely love about Butler. What I absolutely love about Butler is, a re I mean, it's just freaking huge. <laughs> it's a recognition that we ought not to deny material embodiment, which you're going to appreciate even deeper in a bit, as the cosmogony. She's not really interested in that. She's doing a cosmology. Right? Okay, material embodiment is cosmogony for marginalization of feminine identity. Cool. Okay, we can do that. But recognize the book doesn't stop there. There's more to this story. There's more to be told. What is that more, Butler? What more do you have to tell us? This is what she's about to do. And she's going to tell us sort of um, and I'll explain what the phylogeocentric economy is in a bit. Um, but before I do that, let me do the application, finish up number four, and then I'll, I'll come back and tie in some loose ends. So, the qualitative application. How might you justify this claim, right? How might you justify what I just read? You'd have to read it again, obviously. That is, that the phylogeocentric economy excludes the feminine from both, right? It excludes the feminine from total subjective identification, and it excludes the feminine from membership within the phylogocentric economy, right? You are wool men. You don't have the penis, so you're not part of the club, right? But not only are you not part of the club, your identity is subject to marginalized um, uh, conferral. Um, and your mar your, your, the conferral of your identity is itself marginalized. Your identity is conferred via the phylogocentric economy as marginalized, right? And I want to say that again, right? Your identity is conferred via the phylogocentric economy as marginalized. So insofar as it's already, it's always already conferred as marginalized, that's one level of sort of depth. But then in terms of this form matter distinction, if those, if men, for the most part, are in a position where all they're concerned with is the materiality of the body, then you can, you can understand that there's another layer of marginalization because the identity that you gave me was already marginalized and now this marginali marginalized identity that I've been given is now objectified as tits and ass. If it's tits and ass and you play that game of tits and ass, you, I mean, there's, there's arguments for is that empowering, is that not empowering and such. I'm not going to get into that discourse now. What Butler does is, well, what about the form? What about the way in which we have a holistic, genealogical understanding of the complexities in forming that ability to confer marginalized subjective identity? Right? I hope you can follow that. Right? There needs to be a narrative of that ability. So let's talk about, now, now you can see that we're talking about the conditions for the possibility of subjective materiality. Right? We're talking about the conditions, and that's the form, right? Because if I can explain that thing, and Butler does as well, if, if she can, let me check the time, if she can explain this well, and she does this superbly, what she's done is she's given us a, a genealogy of the subjective identity and materiality itself. She's given us the preconditions, if you will, to materiality, at least conceptually, epistemologically, and thus she destroys Plato and the essentialist underpinnings, and uh, whether she wants to or not, she erects herself in 
in his stead. So, um, four. Thus, for Eragure, listen to this. Matter is the site at which the feminine is excluded from philosophical binaries. That binary is the form matter distinction. So I talked about the form matter, and in a bit I'll talk more about this process of exclusion. So let's look at the uh, top of page 30, and this is A at the top of page 30. For Erigeray, it is in this exclusion, right? The fact that we have binary opposition, right? You have man, sorry, oh, I'm out of ink. I'm really getting low on my ink. It is the case that we have, we have man, we have woman, and we have the process of exclusion. You are not me. You are not this. You are not within the norm. Right? This is obviously patriarchy and the phylogocentric economy, the economy of exchange, right? Um, power relations and dynamics. For Ergore, it is in this exclusion that she locates the feminine, which unnerves Butler as its location is for her non-existent. So let's read a quote. This is a direct quote. It's pretty dense, but I want to read this so that you have a proper understanding. For, now this is Butler writing about Erigeray. For Erigeray, what is excluded from this binary is also produced by it in the mode of exclusion. This binary, man, woman, the two being the binary, man, woman, the two being binary. For Erigeray, what is excluded from this binary is also produced by it in the mode of exclusion, that being feminine identity, which we'll see, and has no separable, and, uh, and has no separable of fully, or probably, or fully independent existence as an absolute outside. What does that mean? That means we have, in this binary, an opportunity for man to sort of self-identify. How is this justified? It's justified in words like mankind. It's justified in terms of um, the word he, which means us, generally. So, man can exist and does exist as an isolate. Right? Man can exist and does exist as an independent isolate. However, man, in the process of excluding that which is not man, thus woman, in the process of exclusion, confers subjective identity of the feminine. So that the process of exclusion, and this is why I had to spend so much time talking about the conferral of subjective identity, through the process of uh, exclusion confers through the process of exclusion, confers feminine identification, right? Man can exist independent in and of himself, but that independent existence, um, that independent, ex and she goes so deep with this. She goes so deep. She, she and I, I think I might even incorporate sort of the, the propagation of the species with independent to women. Right? And I, I talk later about sort of genetic implications and such. It's just an amazing... She takes it to that level. She takes it so deep. So when I'm talking about the exclusion of women, I mean absolutely the exclusion of women. Sort of world propagation, including reproduction of the species independent to the existence of women. So that woman is completely superfluous. Right? Completely superfluous. The point of women's... Now, granted, to be fair, Eric Gray didn't have an opportunity to respond to this, right? So, to be fair, Eric Gray might, might completely reject this critique of Butler. Obviously, my lecture series is biased because I'm doing the lecture series on Butler, but the only reason I'm doing the lecture series on Butler is because her philosophical insight is so freaking dense. It's so deep. It's so... You can't even imagine how real the world this is for me right now. But in terms of the identity of the woman, the identity of the woman is always already excluded, and its conferral of identity is one of exclusion. <clears throat> so, for Ergure, what is excluded from this binary is also produced by it in the mode of exclusion, and has no separable or fully independent existence as an absolute outside. 
a constitutive or relative outside, of course, um, composed of a set of exclusions that are nevertheless internal to that system as its own non-thematizable <clears throat> necessity. What in the world does that mean? This becomes the phylogecentric follow economy, right? I'll just put P-E. The phylogecentric economy is the, the economy that is the process in which feminine subjective identity is a consequence of the isolated existence of masculine identity and the conferral of feminine identification as a process of its exclusion. Real complicated crap, right? <clears throat> so this is what Eric Gray is arguing for. So for Eric Gray, what is excluded from this binary is also produced by it. In the mode of exclusion and has no separable, has no separable um, of fully or fully independent existence as an absolute outside. That should make sense. A constitutive or relative outside is, of course, composed of a set of exclusions that are nevertheless internal to the system, the system being the phylogecentric economy, as its own non-thematizable necessity. That is, the woman doesn't then get the opportunity to exist as an independent. It's not thematizable. The woman can only ever exist as an excluded identity within the phylogecentric economy. Um, internal to the system of his non-thematizable necessity. Eric Array insists that this exclusion that mobilizes the form matter binary, which I discussed before, is the differentiating relationship between masculinity and femininity, where the masculine occupies both terms of binary opposition, and the feminine cannot be said to be an intelligible term at all. Now the question obviously is why in the world would a feminist want to assume this position, right? So before we just sort of lambast the whole theoretical effort that um, Irigaray put into her articulation, and I'm assuming that because, you know, Judith Butler is no small-time academic, that she did not create a straw man in arguing that this articulation is in fact representative of Irigaray's um, position. So I'm making the assumption that uh, Butler hasn't, created a straw man here using this to espouse a position that Irigaray doesn't hold. I would assume that Butler is in fact correct and that this articulation does correspond to Irigaray's theoretical position. The question is why would Irigaray assume such a position from a feminist standpoint? There are at least two reasons and I don't, there's more but I don't want to go through them. One, the obvious reason is that there is always already an existing structure of exclusion in place. Exclusion as a lived practice, as a lived experience. Exclusion as a process of sexist, a history of Western sexism. Um, Nietzsche was pretty much a sexist. Um, uh, there's sexist discourses in, there's hellified sexist discourses in, uh, in Aristotle's work. There's sexist discourses in a bit of Kant's work. There's, sex, there's sexism all over Western philosophy. You know, it's hard to find Western philosophers who don't want to say sexist stuff. So that the idea is it's legitimized, Eric Gray's position is legitimized as a consequence of just being a woman, being alive, right? Recognizing that, no, my identity is excluded. I do have to sort of rip my shirt off and flash the tits and ass to remind people that, no, I am a human being, to remind people that, yeah, I do have tits and ass and I know they look great, but can we talk about something more intellectually stimulating? Or we can just talk about tits and ass all day. But the idea is, in terms of in terms of this relationship, no, it would be ridiculous to say that it wasn't based in the materiality of the body. It wasn't based in the real sense of objectification. I don't believe that it's always this, oh, woe is me, you know, masculine power out there is determining. I do believe that you can, and now granted, you know, this might get me in trouble with feminists, but I do believe that you can be empowered. I know this is contradictory for many, but I do believe that you can be empowered as a woman by playing into the game, and, oh, tits and ass is the game? I'm going to do tits and ass better than anybody else, and I'm going to get power from it. Um, you debase yourself in doing that, but you can play that game. There's another sense in which, um, this is all part of sort of the tradition, there's another sense in which, in terms of the lived experience as being a woman, as, I hate to say having tits and ass, when I'm talking about a professor, but, but as having tits and ass, 
Do you know what it's like? You know what it's like to have that gaze in a Sartrean sense. You know what it's like for the other person to just, without care, consideration, for discomfort, for disease, disease, without any consideration to just gaze. And as such, my identity is in part, you know, this is, this is, it's, I don't want to say it's a defeatist position, I think it's a very authentic position, I think it's real. So to defend Eric Gray a little bit, right, Butler's badass, she's, she's great, but to defend Eric Gray a little bit, because uh, I am sympathetic to this position, um, no, my identity really is part of objectified gaze. I don't know, I don't know who I am until somebody tells me how they see me. How do you see me? I present myself well, I think. I, I act well when I'm in the community. I'm not trying to tease people. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I happen to be built the way that I'm built. I happen to look the way that I look. I happen to have the body that I have. Um, but you tell a lot. You tell a lot of who you see me to be the way that you look at me. Right? So you can't really blame me if I feel like every time we interact, you're looking at me like, oh, man, I want to fuck that chick. Right? That, no, I, I'm, I'm excluded, right? So that my identity becomes that of, well, yeah, I'm definitely not part of that group. That look, that gaze is hostile. It's, it's, there's, it's, it's, a, it's threatening. It could destroy me. So I have to sort of be safe and be over here. And you can imagine that, you know, if it was serious enough, and obviously there's tons of rape literature, like, no, I'm, I'm, I want that materiality. The idea is, yeah, you might flash some materiality in order to pacify an aggressor. Right? Don't wait me, here's the body. It's very complex shit we're talking about. This, this ain't no, this ain't no, you know, running, as they say in the devil's advocate, this is no running average every day at the low maxes, right? This is, this is heavy shit, right? The idea is, so in defense of Irigaray in that sense, I, I, you know, I don't want to just immediately say that Butler's critique is all-encompassing and absolutely destructive. Because there is a sense in which that sense of exclusion really does meaningfully confer identity. And a lot of the actions that individuals do in the world as a consequence of that gaze, as a consequence of that sense of exclusion, informs who they are, informs how they think other people see them. The idea is not to reject the materiality, yes, I'm a person. I have these cravings. Some are carnal. Some are violent. Some are malicious. Some are, some are aggressive. Some are, you know, dominating. But that's the base stuff. We need more. And this is where I think um, where Butler really does sort of step above the crowd. Right? So I will give Eric Array points, but I believe um, Butler's articulation is more meaningful because Butler's articulation isn't going to rest with the conferral of identity. That's what's pissing off Butler, to be vulgar. That's what pisses her off. She's like, listen, I'm not going to have my identity. we got to get 100% ghetto with this. I'm not going to have my identity via Eric Gray as a woman, my identity, Judith Butler, via Eric Gray's interpretation of the phallogecentric economy via patriarchy, be a consequence of exclusion only? I'm not going to put myself in a position where my materiality is so debased that I am only that. No, there's something else here. What I'm going to do is articulate the condition in which all of this operates. I'm going to talk about, Butler says, she doesn't say this explicitly, it's there, coded, deep, 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 is I am going to articulate the very condition that allows all of this to be operational. Forget about my subjective identity as being conferred in terms of... Yeah, the Butler's so gangster! She's so... She's so freaking killed. She's a... Uh, she's a... Uh, um, what's she kills Bill's... Uh, Beatrice Kiddo. She's so Beatrice Kiddo. Right? She's got the freaking Hattori Hanzu and she's just... Sla she's hacking and she's slashing and she's chopping. It's like... Uh, Butler's... A, she's a monster. No, it's... A, in a sense, yeah, she's doing feminism. Yeah, that's Butler is. But in another sense, she's like, look, I'm not, this is my interpretation of Butler. I think my interpretation is pretty solid. But I think it's, it's part feminism. It's definitely the cosmology of feminist sort of theory and the transformation of sort of the relation. But in another sense, she's doing a complete, um, she's doing a complete destruction, dismantlement 
of all of Western philosophy and the underpinnings of Western philosophy and the biases of Western philosophy from the time of Plato in relationship to the woman. You don't have the power to confirm my identity. You can do that with everybody else, but you, you don't have the power to confirm my identity. And Butler speaks for herself. Don't speak on my behalf, Eric Gray. I'll talk for myself in terms of my identity, in terms of the way in which I constitute my own subjectivity. It is not constituted with, with, with reference to exclusion. I don't become me as a process of not being you. I don't become me because I'll never be in a group where I need to be loved by some group. I become me of my own effort. You gotta take your hat off to that. You gotta take your hat off to that. So, you know, get a little excited with Butler, but she's pretty much badass. And I put her at the very end for a reason. Always for a reason. B. For Butler, the miming reinforces the phylogocentric economy in place, in place to preserve and justify the marginalization of women. She, uh, she would call this conferral, this agreement of the conferral of feminine subjective identity as a consequence of the exclusionary practices of the phylogocentric economy. Butler would, this is my, right? This is like my nieces, right? It's an imitation, right? Woman then just becomes an imitation of man. She's sort of, uh, you know, she's a part of man. She's not full. She's not complete. She's excluded, always already dejected, always already outside, always already othered. And Butler, rightfully so, is like, look, don't talk on my behalf, right? I'm making Butler real ghetto. She's not real ghetto. Um, she's real gangster. She's real ninja. But you've got to have absolute adoration for a person who says, let me talk about myself for myself. I'll let you know who I am, right? If it's materiality, it's materiality. If it's all form and theory, it's all form and theory. What we'll find out is it's both. It's a little bit of the brawn, but also a little bit of the brain. And I would say with, uh, with, 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 with respect to um, uh, Butler's critique, it's a whole lot of the brain. So for Butler, this miming reinforces the phylogocentric economy in place to preserve and justify the marginalization of women's subjective identity and, obviously, their ontological reality, thus the intelligibility of her existence. So I did that. Number five, direct quote, quote, when and where women are represented within this economy, this whole thing being the economy, when and where women are represented within this economy is precisely the site of their erasure. You debase yourself, and inso insofar as you debase yourself, insofar as you are represented as excluded, your representation is void, it's a vacuum, it's nothing, it's zero, it's null. Why in the world would you want to have that representation, right? So, when and where women are represented within this economy, because the economy is designed to facilitate excluded representation, that is, of the woman, and specifically, tits and ass, to be vulgar. And I hope you guys recognize, I don't mean to be offensive by using that. I want to be vulgar, because today is the day for vulgarity, right? When and where women are represented within the economy, is precisely the site of their erasure, which would be fine if that wasn't acknowledged as an ontological reality. I'll explain that in a second because that's super powerful, which is inherently contradictory. So, here goes, here goes the, the contradiction. It's obviously contradictory. And this is, Eric, uh, this is Butler's critique now, more sort of theoretically profound critique of Eric Gray's um, presuppositions. It's obviously sort of uh, conflated to assume that identification is a consequence of non-existence, that identification, subjective identification, could be conferred in terms of exclusion. I'm no closer, I, I have a feminist theory section, which this is probably going to be part of my feminist theory lectures, because um, this is really good feminist theory. Um, but in the little bit that I posted, maybe an hour or two hours that I've already posted, maybe not even that, I start by saying, we have no ability, in a real sort of reticent tone, we have no real ability to understand what a woman is, or what a thing is, by attempting to articulate it as a, consequences, as a consequence of what it's not. So if I say, I make up a word, uh, uh, I don't know, 
you know, XJWYF 503,002, whatever, that's the word. Um, and I ask you that word. Um, it's not a toothbrush. It's not, um, it's not a cover. It's, it's not a pair of slippers. It's not a, a tire iron. You have no idea of having an understanding of what it is by me telling you what it's not. Similarly, there's a fundamental contradiction in attempting to epistemolo ep epistemologically make sense of subjective identity as a consequence of, as wholly a consequence of exclusion. You can't say that I have gained identity fully as a consequence of, uh, gained a subjective identity fully as a consequence of exclusion, and you could legitimize this in Butler by making an appeal to an aspect of uh, Gitri Spivak, which I did not cover in this lecture series, which is can this subaltern speak, but I did cover in another lecture series. It's just that the idea is to combine Spivak with Butler via Spivak, you recognize that once you have fully attained true subaltern status as an aspect of oppressed or marginalized identification, one subset of a larger set of marginalized identification, such that all subaltern identification is marginalized, but not all marginalized is subaltern. You recognize that real subaltern identification is invisible. There really is no subjective identity because there are no subjects. There's nothing there. That means since there is that non-existence, to talk about exclusion as ontologically real would necessitate the manifestation of the ontological exclusion in terms of Spivak's subalternity. Subaltern identification is no identification to be had because there's no voice to be had. I just completely spoiled can the subaltern speak, right? There's no voice to be had. There's no rep representation to be had. There's no subject to be had. I talk for you. I talk for you. I talk for you. You don't talk. I talk for you. You don't sit. I tell you when to sit. You don't go. I tell you where to go. You don't live. I tell you how to live. Now, you can imagine if that's the relationship, then of course there's no subjective identification. There is no me. And anytime there is me, then there's me as representative, which is something that neither of them even contemplate, which is more to me and less them. But with respect to, with respect to what we're talking about now, um, no, it's, 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 it's dominating, it's patriarchal, it's, 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 prof it's profoundly self-defeating, I feel, for Butler to try and assume a theoretical position in which my subjective identification as woman is conferred in terms of my exclusion. And she rejects it categorically. And you should feel why. Not only does she reject it categorically, on a more theoretical level, on a more logical level, you see that it does result in a contradiction. Because we're attempting to talk about subjective identification as wholly constituted through exclusion, but to wholly constitute, to wholly manifest exclusion socially results in subalternity or maybe even genocide, and thus there is no identification, right? So, I mean, there is no group, and there's various degrees of that sort of marginalization, right? So that should be clear, hopefully. So lastly, the last example for this section, um, the public-private distinction allows for the representation of the woman within the context of the private, but it is precisely within that context that she remains invisible. I don't think people can really understand what that means. You gotta kinda live it. You gotta kinda live it. It is precisely within that context, in her own privacy. Door closed, nobody here, just her. Even then, she's invisible. People don't have an appreciation for who she is because it's tits and ass. Granted, tits and ass are great. We can do tits and ass, but that's so not who she is. She's so much more than just that. And the idea is, imagine that that sort of invisibility, that, that even within the privacy of her own private, where there's no one else to preserve that marginalization to the point of invisibility is... Uh, it takes a real strong soul to be able to uh, thrive in an environment like that. It's very, it's, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. So, more importantly, however, 
the individual becomes unintelligible. And that's tragic, right? Because then there is this, I mean, for me, the individual might lose sense of self, which is really tragic. For me personally, that could never happen. But for most people, given all of those external pressures, given this interpretive approach, were it to be true, yeah, you lose sense of self because I'm nothing but meat. No matter how much I try, no matter how much I contribute, no matter how good I am or how smart I am, I'm always going to be tis and ass. And there comes a point at which I would imagine you'd be like, fuck, like, okay, enough already. Like, well, fuck it. I'm not going to do shit. And you assume a defeatist sort of position. And it's sad, and it's unfortunate. And I would imagine that this narrative has to be the case for so many. Right? So many women probably had, more, more so in a, a sort of last maybe two generations before, I would imagine women went to school, got great levels of education, super smart. You lived in a time of Leave it to be where dad went out to make the money and it was shameful for the wife. Of course, these days, days have passed. But this, these days were real in American history. And it was shameful for the man to have his woman out on, in the workforce. She had to stay home. And I can't tell you how many millions of women sacrificed their careers, sacrificed education, sacrificed their goals, sacrificed their, their expectations and everything to fit this norm that said, it's shameful for you to go out and work because it makes your man look bad. How many women went to their grave? never knowing if they'd become the doctor or the lawyer or the teacher or the engineer or the professor or the clergy or what have you, right? Why? Because it gets so real that even in the privacy of their own home, outside of the public gaze, outside of the view of others, outside of any external stimuli, that that objectification has been internalized and they can't see themselves as being anything other than that. And this is how this is how you stagnate as an individual. This is how you stagnate as a people. This is how you stagnate socially. That you internalize and you believe that. Now, granted, I don't want to, I've extrapolated quite a bit now from Aragore. Butler probably wouldn't even agree that taking it that far is probably too far. But I really think that I've done justice to Butler. Butler's critique of Aragore which presupposes that this accurately reflects, reflects Aragore and is in itself a straw man. I don't know that to be the case or not. I know that I did the analysis well, the conclusions are my own, but those conclusions are problematic and Butler doesn't want that. What she wants is to create a condition, and this is what we'll see, in which I determine who I am. I determine, I constitute my identity. My social interactiveness the nexus of relationships that inform me, inform me, but don't constitute me. I constitute me. And Butler does this well. How does she do this? She destroys Plato. <laughs> she obliterates Plato. Uh, and the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. Uh, and she gives us embers. She doesn't erect the edifice. She gives us embers on putting a little bit of lighter fluid on the embers, and I'm leaving it to the next generation to build a structure. I've done my work. The question is, have you done yours? With that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.